Hi there, my name is Ari Akhavan. I'm a current medical student at the Mayo Clinic, and I've been a small-scale hobbyist faster for about three years now. I write my own designs and publish them online for free. I've taught a few people how to facet, and I'm always more than willing to help anybody who's new to the field. I may not be a pro, but I hope you find this introductory video helpful. If you're just starting out fasting for the first time, or if you're trying to teach yourself from resources online or from books without actually having a fasting machine, it might be useful to get acquainted with the machine first. Let's run through some of the parts of a fasting machine. First, let's get acquainted with the mast. We have the mast riser, which allows us to move the mast up and down. We have the mast lock, which when unlocked allows us to slide the mast assembly forward and backward. We have the digital angle dial, which allows us to change the angle setting of the stone. We have the fine adjustment, which allows us to make fine adjustments to the angle setting of the stone. We have the index gear, which allows us to change the rotational settings of the stone by lifting this lever and rotating the gear. And then we have the fine angle adjustment, formerly known as the cheater which lets us make fine adjustments to the index. Let's take a look at how we turn on the machine. First, we've got the main power. I generally just leave this in the on position. Then we've got the rotational direction. Do you want the lap spinning clockwise, counterclockwise, or do we just want the whole thing off? Once you've set the main power to on, and the rotation to either clockwise or counterclockwise, then we can turn on the machine by moving the dial past this blank spot. When you feel that click, that tells you that the machine is running. Higher settings run at higher speeds. There isn't a one-to-one -one relationship with the speed to RPM though. In general, I do all of my fasting between 3 and 6, and if I'm using a machine-mounted saw, I generally run that as fast as possible with a very strong water drip. Now that we've gotten acquainted with most of the machine, let's get used to the platen. The platen, this surface here, is what your laps will sit on. Laps are the metal cutting discs that are used to actually cut the stone. They can also be found in ceramic or a couple of other composite materials. This arbor nut screws the laps down and holds them tight against the platen. If we didn't do that, then the platen would spin, but the laps would not. We've also got this water drip tank. When we're doing our rough cutting, generally we use water as a coolant and a lubricant so that we don't build up heat in the stone and we don't crack the stone. It also flushes away all of the dust as we grind. This is important because the dust can clog up your laps. When we're cutting the girdle, the part of the stone that forms the outline, we'd need to set this, the angle setting, at 90 degrees. But you can see here that this splash pan, which prevents water from splashing all over you, is in the way. So, we've set this to 90. Let's go ahead and use these screws to hold the splash pan in place. We'll just rotate it around like this. And now you can see that the mast fits comfortably through here. Let's talk about dops. Dops are these little brass sticks that you attach your stone to for the cutting process. The first one that we're going to use is a flat dop. This dop has a flat surface and we're going to use it to stick to a flat surface on the stone. I generally cut myself a new flat surface where the table is going to be just for ease of attachment and for personal comfort. You don't have to do that, but it does make your job a lot easier. After we've cut the pavilion and we want to switch to the crown, we're going to transfer our stone into this cone-shaped dop. As it sounds, it's a cone shape. That's the perfect shape to fit the pavilion of a round stone in. But, what if we've got a rectangle with a keel running along the bottom? A keel is a straight line, essentially like a boat. We can't really put that into a cone shape, but what we have are these V-shaped dops. As you can see, it's got a groove that runs all the way through it. So, it should take the shape of a keel very easily. 
There are other types of DOPs, but we're not going to mention them in this lesson. Now that we've gotten acquainted with the machine, let's talk about some of the other equipment. The first are laps. Laps are the discs that are used for the actual cutting, pre-polishing, and polishing processes. As you can see, this plated lap is a relatively thin sheet of metal, it's still pretty rigid, and it's got diamonds embedded onto the surface. This particular one is a 600 grit. This is the grit that I usually use for most of my cutting. Here's another plated lap. It's a 260 grit lap, so that's a pretty coarse size. I generally don't use this unless I've got a large piece of rough that I really want to take down quickly, or if I've got inclusions around the surface of a piece of rough that I want to just kind of grind out. It's also useful for taking out those odd knobbly bits on rough that you can't really use as part of the final stone. I generally recommend beginners not use one of these because they have a tendency to cause subsurface damage, which will give you all kinds of grief during the polishing stage. Here's a ceramic lap. They used to be used for polishing and give a really good polish, but they've been obsoleted by a lot of new technology that's come out recently. I generally use this as a master lap. A master lap is the lap that you use underneath a plated lap, since if you were to screw down the arbor nut on a plated lap without anything underneath it, it would bend. This is a back lap. It's a metal composite lap, originally intended by the manufacturer to be used as a polishing lap. But now, pretty much everybody uses it for pre-polishing, the stage between cutting, so a 600 grit diamond, and polishing, which is, well, polishing. I use 3000 grit diamond on here. Now, some people use diamond powders, some people use diamond pastes, but the manufacturer has produced this very convenient crayon in a chapstick tube. I'll show you how to use this in a later part of the video. This is a dark side lab. It's a composite lap produced by the same manufacturer as the back lap. Now, for this particular lap, there are one of two ways to use it. You can either use it with an oxide material, for example, cerium oxide, which comes in a convenient crayon also produced by the manufacturer. For oxides, you would use water on this lap. Just spray it with a spray gun or use a slow water drip. and I'll show you how to use this later in the video. You can also use it with diamonds. The manufacturer also produces dye sticks in 60,000, so that's pretty small, or 100,000, which is very, very small. Either way, this lap is an exceptionally good polishing lap, and it's very, very beginner friendly. Now that we've talked about the fasting machine, and we've talked about the laps that we're going to be using to cut the rough, let's actually talk about the rough. So, how do we tell if a piece of rough is going to produce a good stone? First, let's look at its shape. If the shape is nice and round and blocky, close to something like a sphere or a cube or an egg shape, something along those lines, we'll probably get a good yield out of it. But if it's something that's flat and tabular, or if it's really blobby, or it's got random bits that stick out to the side, then it's probably not going to give us too high of a yield, so let's stay away from those. Now, what about the cleanliness? If there's bubbles and cracks and things like that, and they're towards the ends of the rough, we're probably going to cut those out anyway. But if there's bubbles and cracks and things that run through the middle of the stone, then we're probably going to have to saw through the stone. And why would you buy something at a price for a large piece of rough, when really it's just two smaller pieces of rough that happen to be connected? Now, let's talk about the color. If we've got something that's really, really dark, it's probably not going to lighten up. If we've got, let's say, a piece of aquamarine that's really pale, do we really want to be paying aquamarine prices for something that's going to cut white? No. Now, there are two simple tests that we can do for color. The first is called the white paper test. Take your rough, put it on a white sheet of paper in ambient lighting. Can you see what color the rough is? If it's dark, or if it's black, then you probably don't want that piece of rough. Now let's try the small mirror test. This is the second stage. If you've passed the white paper test, put it on a small mirror and shine a light through the top. The color that reflects back through 
is going to be the closest color possible to the color of the finished stone. If that's a color that you particularly like, then you should probably get a piece of rough. Let's look at some rough. On the far left, we've got a piece of peridot. This piece of rough is exceptionally clean. There are no cracks, fails, bubbles, or anything like that at any point in the stone. It's also got very good color. We can see on this white sheet of paper that this stone is green. Now let's look at this piece. This is a piece of smoky quartz. It's nice and blocky, and we can see that there's pretty much nothing wrong with it. But, if you look very closely, along these black lines that I've drawn in, you can actually see big veils. So, I'm just going to grind those out. Now, let's look at this piece of rhodolite. If we look at the color, it's got a very attractive purple color. Pink. But, what's wrong with it? It's paper thin. It's an extremely thin piece of rough, and this is not going to give us any kind of good yield. There's also, in the, the small thick portion of it, there's a big crack running through it. So while this piece of rough has a great color, it's totally useless. Now, let's look at this. I don't even know what this is, but it's pitch black. There's no way that this is going to lighten up when it's cut. So, I'm just going to use it as a paperweight, because, I mean, what's the point in cutting something that's not going to turn out well? So, to recap, the best rough that I have is nice, blocky, it's got a good color to it, and there's no inclusions in it whatsoever. The worst rough that I have is either pitch black or paper thin. You remember this piece of smoky quartz that I talked about when I was talking about rough? Well, I'm going to use this for the cutting demonstration. So, if we imagine the piece with the veil just being removed, this piece of rough looks pretty much round. So, I'm going to go with this standard round brilliant design. If we take a look here, we can see that this part of the stone is pretty flat. So I'm going to grind myself a flat surface there to attach the dot to. I'm just going to grind out this small piece completely, since it's not really usable, and if I were to saw it off, I wouldn't get a large enough piece of rough to do anything with. So, for this preforming process, or grinding stuff out by hand, I'm going to be using a plated 600 grit topper lap on top of a ceramic master lap. Remember, you can't use a plated lap directly on top of the platen, because if you screw it down, the plated lap will bend. So, this process is called preforming. But don't confuse this with an actual preform. A preform is a piece of rough that's already been shaped into the general outline of a stone, meaning it's got a basic hand ground pavilion and a basic hand ground crown. Now I'm going to go ahead and preform this piece of quartz. Normally, I would recommend using a 600 grit for beginners, since a 260 grit can put a lot of damage. But I'm really lazy. So I'm going to go ahead and use a 260 grit to get rid of most of the volume, and then I'm going to go back over it with a 600 to get rid of those large, deep scratches. So when you're doing this, just like with other cutting, you're going to want to make sure you have a water drip running. You can go pretty fast if you want, especially since this is just a rough process. It's not anything that you're really worried about. flat spot that I'm going to use as my table in the future, and that's where I'm going to attach my flat dot to. When you're grinding in the table, you don't necessarily need to grind a large flat area. You just need something that's going to be the same size as your table when the stone is done, and you need something large enough to attach your dot to. So I've only cut in a narrow band running across the top of the stone. When you're doing your preforming, don't get carried away and hog off a lot of your rough. You want to only go until you've gotten rid of the cracks, bumps, and random little bits that you want to get rid of. If you go too far, then, I mean, you're wasting rough that you could be using. For the love of God, 
please do not listen to anybody who tells you to use a 100 grit lap. There are some very, very limited uses for something like that, like if you have a 5,000 karat piece of quartz, but for the most part, you're never going to want to touch one. Now that I'm done preforming on the 260 grit, I'm going to go ahead and spin my lap dry. You don't want to leave your laps wet, because then they have a tendency to rust, or corrode in general. So I'm just going to spin this at high speed, until I no longer feel water getting sprayed off of the lap. Then I'm going to look at it. Does it look dry? Not quite yet. So I'm just going to keep running the lap, until there's both no water leaving when I put my hand close to it. Please don't touch the lap right now. And it looks dry. So, as you might have noticed, there's water splashing off of this. What you might not have noticed is that that can carry small bits of diamond with them. So whenever you're moving from a large grit to a smaller grit, in this case I'm moving down from a 260 to a 600, you're going to want to wipe down your equipment. This helps prevent contaminating a small grit size with a larger grit size. So now, I've switched from my 260 to my 600. Since I'm not doing any precision cutting right now, I'm not going to bother cleaning down the equipment. But if I was actually faceting, then I would clean it down. Now that I've gone ahead and preformed the rough, and ground myself a flat spot, I'm going to go ahead and dock it. Let's talk about the docking process. So now that we've ground a flat spot on this rough and we've finished preforming it and grinding out all the flaws, what do we do? Well, we're going to figure out where we want to attach the dop to. Since this piece of rough is nice and round and it's pretty evenly deep all the way around, I'm just going to go ahead and dop it right in the middle. So normally when I'm dopping a stone, I write on top of the stone around the table where I want to attach the dop. For expensive stuff, I'll usually print out a copy of the diagram down to scale and I'll put it on top of the stone, and then I'll use that to draw in, with a sharpie, a spot that kind of bleeds through the paper and ends up on the stone. But for this, since it's a cheap piece of rough, I'm just going to go ahead and eyeball it with a sharpie. So now that we've gone ahead and drawn the center point on this piece of rough, how are we going to pick what size dot to use? Well, we want a dot that's large enough to stick to most of the surface, but we want a dot that's small enough so that if we run into problems, we don't run the risk of cutting the dop itself. Let's take a look at this 8mm dop. It's a pretty big dop, right? We put it on there, and we can see that we've got some margin for error, but if we run into problems, I really don't want to cut this dop. So, I'm going to follow the rule of thumb and go with a dop one size smaller. This is a 5mm dop. It's actually two sizes smaller. But, if I take a look, it fits comfortably. I've got a nice, large margin of error around the edges, and it's definitely going to be large enough to be able to stick to the stone with no problems. So I'm going to use this one. So now that we've gotten everything ready, how are we actually going to attach the dop to the stone? Well, there are three ways that people normally try. You can either use epoxy, you can use dopping wax, or you can use cyanoacrylate superglue. So people usually call it CA glue for short, but it's basically just superglue. For beginners, I generally recommend superglue, just because it's easy to work with, you don't have to use a hot torch for anything, and you don't run the risk of burning your hands. Plus, you can just use acetone to dissolve it if you make a mistake. Since this is a nice inexpensive piece of rough, I'm not really going to worry too much if I screw this up. So, I'm going to take my cyanoacrylate glue, and I prefer Gorilla Glue's version with the impact formula, since if you knock the stone it won't pop off the dop. I'm going to take this, and I'm going to apply a small drop right on top of where I drew that spot. Now, I'm going to tape my dot and try to center it perfectly on this dot. And once I do that, I'm going to hold it there for a good 30 seconds or more, just to make sure that it sticks well. So I'm just going to hold this here and make sure that I get a nice, good stick. If 
you could find a gel-based superglue, those are usually a little bit easier to work with because they have less of a risk of running off the stone and sticking your fingers together. So I've held the dop on there for a good 30 seconds. Now, the superglue is still definitely liquid. So what I'm going to do, since I didn't use a gel formula this time, is just go ahead and give it a spray of accelerant. That'll help solidify the glue faster. Now, accelerant runs the risk of making the bond weaker, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to go ahead and do that. And then if I want an additional extra layer of protection, after I've sprayed that accelerant, I'll do another layer of superglue that moves up the dop this way a little bit more and around the edges of the stone more. Now that I've dopped the stone, I'm going to do a quick flick test. If the stone falls off the dop when you tap it a few times, then you know that you haven't done a good job. So right now it looks like the stone is stuck on there pretty hard. You can also try the tension test. Take the stone and kind of push it against your finger. Make sure to rotate it all the way around. If it doesn't fall off at any point, then that means that when you're faceting and you're applying pressure to the stone against the lap, the stone's not going to fall off. If the stone does fall off, that's a pain in the ass to deal with, so you really want to avoid that problem. And I'll cover how to fix that in a later lesson. Now that the stone is dopped, let's go ahead and put it in the machine. Since this stone is round, it's not going to really make too much of a difference how we put it in here. Make sure to loosen the screw a little bit and slide the dop in until it's pretty deep in there. And tighten the screw down hard so that the stone doesn't run the risk of turning or falling out. Now you can see it's pretty centered, it's nice and round. Now if we were cutting, let's say, a trillion or a square, we would want to rotate the rough before we screwed this in so that we'd have the square outline the same way that it's oriented on our diagram. Now that we've got our stone dopped and in the quill, Let's go ahead and set the angle setting. So I'm going to just flatten this down. Unfortunately, this does need both hands, and I don't have a tripod, so I can't film myself doing this. But you're going to take that thumb screw that's back, all the way back around here, loosen it. With your right hand, you're going to pull that whole assembly, once it's unscrewed, this way, until it's hitting the machine. Then you're going to very carefully raise and lower the quill until your angle measurement reads what you're looking for. When you tighten down the large thumb screw, it's going to raise your angle a little bit. So generally, you want to undershoot the angle that you're trying to get to. For example, if you're trying to get to 45 degrees, start screwing it in when you're at 44.8 degrees. By the time you've tightened that thumb screw in the back all the way, you should be pretty close to 45 degrees. Then you can just use your fine adjustment screw to get to 45 itself. Now that we've docked the stone with the stone and the quill and gotten our angle and index settings ready, let's go ahead and get started. For this example, I'm going to be using the unstacked standard round brilliant from Fasting 101, Lesson 3. And I'll start with the P1 tier of facets. So I've set the angle setting to 43.5 degrees and the index to 3. To start off, we're going to move the mast all the way up, unlock the mast, slide it forward until the stone is just close to, but not quite touching the arbor nut, and then we're going to relock the mast. Now, gradually lower the mast until the stone barely touches. I'm going ahead and gotten the water grip started because we don't want to be fasting dry. That can put strain on the lap, and that can run the risk of overheating and cracking your stone. So I've got the water drip running. I'm going to go ahead and turn the machine on to speed of 7, just because I want this to go a little bit faster. 
And then I'm going to go ahead and lower this down to the lap. Do you hear that kind of skipping sound? Gradually, as we cut, that skipping sound is going to disappear. That means that the stone has been ground away to the level that we've set our mast to, and that means that we should go ahead and either lower our mast or move on. In this case, since we've just started, I'm going to take a look at the stone and see that, oh hey, there's not really a big facet on here. So I'm going to keep going. The main aim of this step is to cut the center point of the stone accurately. So what you're going to want to do is keep moving with this facet until when you look at the stone from that bird's eye view, the tip of this facet closest to the center of the dot is almost at the center of the dot. Pro tip, make sure that you always watch the level of water in your drip tank, because you don't want it to run out in the middle of faceting. If you do, it might take you a while to notice that you're actually faceting dry, and that puts a lot of strain on both your laps and your stone and runs the risk of overheating, which is bad for both superglue and for dot wax, because both of them get weaker bonds as you heat the material. As you can probably tell from the video, I'm very lazy, and if there's a faster, easier way to do something, I'll probably do it that way. So, that's why I love one of the features of Ultratech's digital angle dial, the beeper. It's annoying as hell, but it makes everything go faster. Lower your stone to its current angle setting. Just hands off for now. Now, press the set button. Really annoying, right? So now, every time that the stone comes down and stops against that hard stopping point, you'll get a buzzer sound. Why is this useful? Because it allows you to do other things while you're fastening. Let's take a look. So right now, I'm going to be cutting a facet. I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing. I could be watching sports, having a conversation, be up on the phone, but as I cut, once I get my facet ground all the way to the point that it should be at, the buzzer will sound. And that can mean that without even looking at anything, I can just go ahead and switch to the next index. You can see how that would be useful, because that means there's a lot less looking and a lot more blind, fast cutting, which is great, especially when you're working on a larger piece of rough. Just so that you're aware, all of these spots on the machine are bits of water and stone dust that were kicked up from the fasting process and have landed on the equipment. This can actually carry contaminants with it, like large grits of diamond. So, whenever you switch from a large grit, 260, to a smaller grit, 600, Make sure to wipe down your equipment. You're going to want to wipe down the stone and the quill, the index gear, this bottom assembly, pretty much any surface that can develop stone dust and might fall off onto the lap. That includes the lamp. One of the big problems that some people have is that water gets kicked up from the lap, lands on the lamp and then as it dries, bits flake off and fall back onto, a, let's say, a polishing lap. That contaminates the polishing lap with a cutting grit of diamond. Let's take a quick break from cutting and take a look at our facet. So you can see right here, this is that large facet that I've been grinding away. Here's the edge of that facet, so let's see if I've gone too far or not quite enough. You can see that the edge has gone into, but not quite to the center of, the shadow of the dop. You can see that faint black circle right around here goes that way. Now, this will give us a little bit of a margin of error. It's always better to undercut and then have to go back and cut a little bit more than to overcut and lose material. So, now that I've cut this facet, let's go ahead and do three more. I generally do either two or three extra facets at a time, so that gives me a nice crisp point at which all of them come together, as opposed to if I were to only do two facets total, which would just give me a straight line across the stone. I want to make sure that that point, the culet point, or in this case the temporary culet, is centered right over the dot. So now, I've gone ahead and cut four of the P1 facets. I've cut at 43.5 degrees on the 3, the 27, the 51, and the 75. 
Now, if I had cut all the way, you would see that these two edges would blend together into a single line. These two edges would blend together into a single line, and they would come together to form a crisp point directly centered over the top. Since there's this area right here that I haven't quite cut yet, that means that I need to cut a little bit more. I've gone ahead and cut these P1 facets, the 3, the 27, the 51, and the 75, until they meet at a point centered directly over the top. You can tell that they meet accurately because these two lines blend together into the same line without a stair step at the point. The same goes for these two lines. They come together into a perfect point without stair stepping off to the side. So now, since I did this with a 260 grit, I'm going to go back over it with a 600. I'm also going to go ahead and just cut the rest of the P1 tier. When I do that, I'm going to notice that facets gradually appear here, and then the tip of the facet moves up this line until it reaches the point. I want to cut only until it reaches this point perfectly. If I overcut it, then I'll notice that this facet kind of overlaps past here, and the lines will no longer meet at a point in the middle. That's bad, because that means I have to go back and do it again. The point of having this point at the tip that every facet meets at is that this is how we get accuracy for developing our girdle outline, so the round shape of the stone. If some of our P1 facets are off, then that's going to mean that our girdle is going to be uneven, and that'll affect the crown. So now that I've cut a few more facets onto the pavilion, I'm going to go ahead and switch to the 600 you'll notice that my center point isn't quite centered. I've got a lot of extra room over here, and not quite as much over here. That just means that I didn't quite do a good centering job. Now, if this area happens to be shallow, or has a few cracks, then that would have actually been a good job, because that would mean that that area would get cut out. Here, you can see that I've cut the entire P1 tier, all 16 facets, to a center point. This center point, centered directly over the top, is called the culet point. In the past, people would actually grind a flat spot on the culet, but honestly that's kind of silly, because you're losing material, and we actually use the culet point to determine the girdle outline. Speaking of which, if we accidentally overcut one of these facets and mess up our culet point, when we go to cut our girdle, will get a little bit off on our girdle outline because of that misshapen P1 facet. So, getting a culet point as accurate as possible is key in getting our girdle outline. And we'll see in a later step of faceting that if we mess up our girdle outline, that runs the risk of messing up everything else, and these errors can actually compound as we move towards the crown. So now I'm going to go ahead and cut the girdle. If you remember, to do that we've got to first lower the splash pan, because otherwise that would be in the way. So I'm going to go ahead, I've set this to 90 degrees already, and I'm going to lower the mast all the way down until the stone touches. If you notice, if we accidentally have the mast too far forward, now the quill is actually over the lap. That's bad, because that runs the risk of cutting into the quill, which is something that really really does not want to be cut into. So I'm going to slide that back a little bit. You'll also notice that on some dops, the part that's attached to the stone is actually narrower than the part that goes into the quill. For those types of dops, we want to make sure that the wide part of the dop is not over the lap either, because then we run the risk of cutting into that. Essentially, have as little of the dop over the lap as possible, just to avoid the risk of cutting into Now, here's a key piece of time-saving advice. When we're cutting the girdle, I'm going to go ahead and lower this until the stone just touches the lap. And I've noticed that as I'm lowering it, suddenly the 90 degrees changes to 90.01. That means that the stone is touching the lap, and I've moved a little bit past that. But, I'm going to go ahead and rotate the stone, just randomly, or to an area that looks kind of shallow. Now, you see how this is not touching the lap? That means that this area is lower. So I'm going to go ahead and lower the mast again 
until I just notice an angle change. So I'm still lowering, still lowering. There we go. So I'm going to keep doing that and keep rotating the stone until I find the area that is the lowest out of the entire girdle. If I start cutting there, that means that when I cut the girdle, it'll all be done at once. If I start cutting the girdle at a higher point, then that means I'm going to be cutting facets, cutting facets, cutting facets, and then, oh no, I get to a certain index, and it's not cutting anymore. Because that area is farther towards the middle than the rest of the girdle facets that I've been cutting. So if I want to save time on constantly having to cut, look, adjust the mast, cut, look, adjust the mast, I can just go ahead, find that lowest point to begin with, and start cutting from there. It's an easy reference point. So how do we know that the girdle facets are accurate? Well, as long as we make sure that all of our pavilion facets are cut to a perfect culet point, specifically, as long as we make sure that all of the pavilion facets that generate the girdle outline are cut to a perfect culet, then we can take a look at the line of the girdle, this line right here, and look at it closely. If we notice any stair-stepping, for example, for this facet right here, if we notice that at this junction it steps down a little bit, travels across the facet evenly, and then steps back up, that means we've undercut this girdle facet and need to cut it a little bit more. If it's the other way around, if it jumps up, travels a little bit, and then jumps back down, that means we've overcut that facet and need to go back around the entire rest of the girdle to cut to that same depth. So if I was to individually inspect every facet, I would constantly have to change the index, rotate the gear, change the index, rotate the gear. That's kind of frustrating. There is a convenient feature called freewheeling. Lift the lever that changes the index, then slide this pin forward. Now, this lever is stuck in the open position, which allows us to freely spin this gear. This makes it very easy to inspect the girdle to make sure that the junction between the P1 facets and the G1 facets are straight. As you can probably tell from all the water covering my machine, cutting the girdle can be a very wet and splashy process. It's best to lower your water drip until it's just barely the amount of water that you need, but still, it's probably going to splash all over the place. Some people actually put sponges in between, let's say, right here, or against the drip tank post, to absorb most of that water to prevent it from flinging off at you. But, I'm too lazy to do that, and I don't think I have a kitchen sponge to do that with, so I've got water all over my machine. It's very important to clean this well, because if that water gets in between the teeth on your index gear, it can actually start to wear those teeth down or widen that space. And that's not something that you want. So as it turns out, I did have a sponge to use. So I nestled it in between the lap and the post that the drip tank is attached to. This has definitely been helpful for decreasing the amount of splash. That's the entirety of the splash that I got for the entire girdle when I switched from 260 to 600. At this point, I've cut all of the pavilion facets that generate the girdle outline. I've also cut the entire girdle, and made sure that the girdle is level with no stair stepping. So this means I'm ready to go ahead and pre-polish. Now, there are more facets on the pavilion that I need to cut, but in order to maintain accuracy, I'm going to pre-polish all of these facets that I have now first. So, let's think about why. Take this particular diagram, for example, the unstacked standard round brilliant. If I were to cut all of P1, then all of G1, and then cut P2, then when I go back to pre-polish P1, I can just go ahead and pre-polish, 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 but I have no idea how deep I've gone. And, since I've overwritten the temporary Hewlett point, I have no point to judge to see if I've overcut one facet compared to all the rest. So, if I leave out the P2 facets, 
and just have P1 and G1, I can pre-polish all of P1, make sure that everything comes to a Q-lit point. Then I can pre-polish G1, make sure that the girdle line is perfectly level. From here on out, I know that my girdle outline is perfect, so I don't have to worry about other facets overriding the Q-lit point. Now that I'm done doing all of the rough cutting for most of the pavilion, I'm going to go ahead and pre-polish. So, I'm going to get out my pre-polishing lap, which is the bat lap with 3,000 diamond. Now, between the 600 grit and the 3,000 grit, you want to wipe down your machine, just to prevent contamination between your 600 grit and your 3,000 grit. Every time you go from a large grit to a small grit, it's a good idea to just wipe everything down. For pre-polishing, especially with a lap like the bat lap, every so often you're going to want to add a little bit extra diamond because as you're cutting, you're sweeping some of that diamond off the lap and you're applying wear and tear on your lap. To kind of refresh everything, we're going to charge it a little bit more. So how do we use a bat lap? Well, first, we're going to take some kind of oil-based lubricant, in this case WD-40, although I prefer the manufacturer's snake oil Gonna run the lap slowly. Give it a very brief spray down. Now I'm gonna take my dye stick, just run a little bit out, and then lightly brush, starting from the outside and gradually moving inward until I see that the entire lap is covered with a fresh layer. It's not very important that you get full coverage because as you cut, or as you pre-polish in this case, you're going to spread the diamond evenly around the lap. Once your lap is fully charged, this usually takes maybe five or six stones and quite a bit of diamond. You'll notice that it acquires kind of a gray sheen. Once you get to that point, you'll very rarely need to add this. For example, I'll finish an entire 10, 12 millimeter stone without having to touch this up until I move to the crown. I've gone ahead and set my angle and index for P1. Now, I'm going to slowly lower the stone to the lap, and just as I did with the girdle, I'm going to notice as soon as I see the angle changing. You can hear that the stone is barely touching the lap. So I'm going to go ahead and run it. I generally pre-polish at a speed of 4 on an Ultratech V5. If you go too fast, then you're kind of going to be hydroplaning, which means that you're not getting any work done on the stone. Now, with pre-polishing, and especially when using oil, you're going to notice that black goo starts to develop. Just like the white powdery stuff from the cutting stage, this is just swarf embedding itself in your lubricant. Which means that every so often, you're going to wipe your lap down and apply a fresh layer of WD-40. Now, when I'm pre-polishing, I want to make sure that I don't accidentally overcut a facet. So, I'm going to make my best effort to cut all of the pavilion facets at the same rate, so setting a 4 for speed, with the same number of sweeps of the lap. So what I've been doing for this particular series is doing three sweeps. So that's forward and back. So that's one, and back, two, and back and then three, and back. As long as I maintain an even sweep speed between facets, so that's how fast I'm going back and forward, then I know that every facet should be cut the same amount past where it used to be. Now, there's a specific concern with the pre-polishing step, which is that you're going to gradually build up WD-40 and swarf on the stone. So I usually take some paper towels, tear them up into small pieces, and use that to wipe everything off. That's also how I get through the film that WD-40 leaves on the stone, and that way I can see where I've pre-polished and where I haven't. How do you tell when your pavilion facets are pre-polished? Well, it depends on the material. If you've got something like iolite, for example, you'll notice that once you go from a 600 to a 3000, there's a huge change. It'll look dull and rough with the 600, 
But when you switch to pre-polishing, it'll be crisp and clean, and you'll be able to see right through the stone. It almost looks polished. With materials like quartz, there's actually a little bit of a hazy, frosty look. So when you have the stone in its cut form, after using a 600, all of the facets will appear frosty. You won't really be able to see into the stone. When you pre-polish it, then you'll be able to see into the stone. With something like cubic zirconia, for example, it'll go from a frosty appearance, while being able to see partially through the stone, to a crisp, nearly polished appearance. With quartz in particular, it can be really hard to tell if you pre-polish the facet or not. Regardless of how you do it, you're still going to get a little bit of a weird frosty haze. And when your facets are wet, especially after a 600, they, they can almost appear pre-polished, because when the facets are wet on 600, you can see into the stone. When the facets are dry on a pre-polish, especially on quartz, it looks the same as when it's wet on a 600. And especially when you're using WD-40, you can't really tell if a facet's just covered in WD-40 or if it's actually been pre-polished. So what I do is I take a Q-tip, dip it in some rubbing alcohol, and use that to clean off the stone. Now, if you're using dopping wax, you need to be particularly careful because rubbing alcohol can actually dissolve the wax that you've used. So I've gone ahead and brushed this with rubbing alcohol and then brushed it back off. Now I'm going to turn that light back on. And yep, all of these facets look fully pre-polished. Now, normally when I pre-polish, I'm going to pre-polish four specific facets first, just like when I was cutting the pavilion, and I did the 3, the 27, the 51, and the 75. I'm going to do those same facets first, make sure that I come to a perfect center point by checking for that cross, and then I'm going to pre-polish the rest of the facets to meet that culet point. Now, in the interest of saving time, I'm just going to go ahead and do everything quickly with a little bit less attention to accuracy. So, when you're pre-polishing the girdle, remember that most of the girdle is going to get cut away when we do the crown. So you can actually kind of cheat here a little bit and set your angle to, let's say, 89.7 or something along those lines. Now, when you pre-polish, you're technically going to be cutting a new facet, but it doesn't really matter. You don't necessarily have to do your girdle at 90 degrees. Who's going to notice 0.3 degrees of difference? This also saves us time and effort because instead of having to polish the entire girdle, you're only polishing a narrow band that goes across the top. Now that I've gone ahead and pre-polished the entire pavilion, I've got to do my P2 facets. And there are two ways to do this. If I had a smaller stone, then I would obviously just use the pre-polish lap to cut in those facets. Since they're relatively close in angle and index, they're going to cut pretty quickly. Now, for a larger stone, and I would consider this a medium-ish, large, medium-ish stone, it makes more sense to go back to the 600 and grind those facets in. But, you want to be extremely careful to make sure not to overcut. Because if you overcut, then you've obliterated one of those meats that you are going to use as a reference point. Now, when you're done with a pre-polished lap, you want to make sure to wipe it down pretty cleanly. You're going to have some leftover oil residue on it, especially with bat laps, which are designed to kind of sweat the oil back out. So, I'm going to turn on my lap on a slow setting, maybe two or three, and just run a paper towel over it, clean up all of that extra swerve, all of the extra oil, just get it clean. And you'll notice that the paper towel gradually turns black. That's just from all the swerve you're picking up. Also, make sure to get the edge of the lap, because a lot of oil and swerve tends to build up there. So at this point, I've gone ahead and set my angle and my index to match what P2 is saying. So I've got this at 41.5 with my index at 96. Now, instead of going ahead and turning on the fastening machine, because this is a facet that's going to cut pretty quickly, I'm going to do this by hand. So what I'm going to do is wet an area of the lap, rotate the lap so that the wet area is directly under the stone, and I'm going to lower the stone until it just touches the lap. And I'm going to manually grind this in. 
So I've got one hand stabilizing the lap so that the lap is not spinning. And then with my other hand, I'm grinding away a facet. This gives me a lot more control over how fast I'm cutting. Now, since this stone is larger than most rounds that I cut, it does look like the fasten is moving pretty slow. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on the fasten machine. Now that I've finished pre-polishing, I'm going to go ahead and polish. To do that, I'm going to switch to my dark side lap. Now, to use a dark side lap, we're not going to use WD-40 and we're not going to use a water drip. Instead, I'm going to use a spray gun. So, running the lap at about 4, I'm going to spray it a few times so that there's a really light covering of water. Now, for quartz, the best polishing agent is probably zirconium oxide, but the old standby is cerium oxide, and that's what I have on hand, so I'm just going to use that. To use the back stick, I'm just going to take the stick and just really lightly run it along the lap from inside to outside until the entire thing looks like it's shiny and black. So what I've basically just done is spread the water around from inside to outside. This also carries with it a thin film of cerium oxide. So you might be asking, what order do I polish my facets in? Honestly, it doesn't really matter. If you're not doing competition cutting, then the tiny amounts that you're going to be moving these facets during the polishing stage is just not going to be noticeable. So what I would recommend is just follow the order as given on the diagram. For some reason, I completely forgot to film myself while I was actually polishing. So basically, the polishing process is going to run exactly the same way as the pre-polishing process. You're going to maintain even pressure while you sweep across the lap the same number of times for each set of facets in the same tier and it's going to be very easy to inspect the difference between a pre-polished facet and a polished facet, especially on quartz. Now, there is a small chance that you'll have some issues like scratching or like fine scratches, stuff like that, chipping along the facet junction, but honestly, those aren't something that we need to worry about right now because those are going to be really small and you're not going to notice those in a set stone. I'm going to talk about troubleshooting in the next segment, but for some of these more advanced troubleshooting issues, I'm going to talk about that in an entirely separate video. Did you notice that we didn't actually polish the girdle? Why do you think that is? If you answered laziness, you're right. Nobody's going to notice the difference between a pre-polish and a true polish when your stone is set in jewelry, especially with a girdle that's between 0.1 and 0.3 millimeters thick. Now, during competitions, you're required to polish the girdle. However, in real life, since nobody's going to see it, there's no real purpose in polishing it. What are some common mistakes that beginners usually make with polishing? Well, there's three of them. Using too much polishing compound, going too fast, and using too much pressure. If you're using too much pressure, or if you're using too much oxide, then the oxide is going to ball up underneath the stone. It's going to form little aggregate clumps, and those basically act as a higher grit size which means that it'll carve new scratches through your stone, and it'll basically be undoing your polish. As for going too fast, then since you're using a thin film of either water or oil on top of the lap, you're basically going to be hydroplaning, which means that the stone is no longer in contact with the lap. So to make up for that, most people end up applying more pressure, which will lead to balling up and scratching. So remember, don't go fast, don't use too much oxide or diamond, and don't use too much pressure.
Now that we're done with the pavilion, let's go ahead and transfer the stone. During the transfer process, we're going to remove the stone from the quill. We're going to insert this dot into a transfer jig with a cone dot, and then we're going to glue this to the cone dot. While we're waiting for the glue to set, I can either use an accelerant or take this opportunity to go ahead and clean the fasting machine. Now that it's time to transfer, how do we choose what DOP to transfer to? Well, you basically just want the largest DOP size possible that will fit over the stone without going past the girdle. Since we've already cut the girdle, there's no risk of having to go back and recut it, which means that we want as large of a surface area contacting the stone as possible. Now, here's an Ultratech transfer jig. You'll notice that the ends of each DOP are cut. This is called keying and I'll talk about this later. But, as you'll notice, there are two V-shaped furrows on either side that can accept dops. These two screws here and these metal bars act to hold the dops in place. For the actual transfer process, I'm going to put glue inside this cone, then use this metal bar and this metal bar to slide the two dops together until they make contact. That way, the glue is going to smear all over the inside of this cone dop and all over the outside of the stone. Once I do that, I'm going to make sure that these two are touching each other pretty tightly. I'm going to screw these two down to hold the dops in place. This alignment process is critical because if one of the dops is tilted, then your transfer is going to be tilted and that's going to cause you all kinds of heartache in the future. So, it looks like our transfer has worked. But, just to make sure, let's test this new bond. This is the new dop. I'm going to hold the stone, I'm going to flick the dop from all different directions. It's not coming off. That's a good sign. I'm also going to do that rotate test where I'm going to rotate and apply pressure. So how do we remove the old dop? Well, you could use acetone to dissolve the superglue on this side, but that would take a while. My preferred method is actually to wrap the stone and the new dop in a wet paper towel, and then Apply a blowtorch to the old dot. If you remember, using heat makes the superglue bond weak. That's one of the reasons that we use water as a kind of lubricant and cooling agent, so that we don't weaken the bond by accident. Now, we're going to weaken it intentionally. Here, you can see that I've wrapped the new dot and most of the stone in a wet paper towel. This is the new side. This is the old side. So now I'm just going to go ahead and take my butane torch, and without lighting anything nearby on fire, I'm going to heat this. I'm going to give it a go for maybe 10 seconds. Now I'm just going to tap on this dot. It should get to a point where this dot is just going to go ahead and fall off. But if that doesn't happen, that means we need to apply a little bit more heat. Again, please, for the love of God, do not burn yourself. All right. If you notice, that's just popped right off. The water in the paper towel is supposed to keep the stone and the new dop cool. That'll help prevent that bond from weakening. So I'm going to go ahead and unwrap this and feel the stone. In this case, it actually feels like the stone heated up a little bit. That's not something that I particularly wanted to happen, which means that this bond could be a little bit weaker. So, that just means I'm going to proceed with extra caution this time around to make sure that the dop does not fall off. We may have transferred the stone, but we still need to align it. What does that mean, though? I've got the dot inside the quill, but I haven't screwed it down yet. I can still freely rotate it. What I want to do is set the girdle. So I'm going to go ahead and set this angle to 90 degrees. Now, I want to bring this in contact with the lap. But I'm not just using any old lap. I'm using my master lap, which is supposedly perfectly flat. If you notice, 
since this is just kind of floating in here freely, there's no way for us to eyeball whether or not one of the girdle facets is perfectly aligned with where it should be. So we're going to do that manually by basically lowering the stone until it makes contact with the lap, setting this index to one of the correct girdle facet indexes. In this case, I'm setting it to 3. And I'm going to lower, lower, lower until I feel contact. Now, I want to make sure that I'm pushing down. The stone is not rotating in any direction. That means that the facet for the girdle is perfectly flat against this lap. Now, I know that it's lined up, so I can go ahead and tighten the screw down. When we start cutting the crown, the first crown facet that we cut is going to set our girdle width. So, make sure that you're only cutting to a certain depth so that you leave enough girdle room to play with. As we cut the rest of the crown facets, we're going to notice that we're either going to get a perfectly level line that goes all the way around as a circle, or we're going to get a spiral that goes up or goes down. If, when we're cutting, we notice that the spiral goes up and to the right, then that means we were a little bit off when we did our manual alignment, and we need to rotate the cheater clockwise. So if you notice that spiral with the right hand side being higher than the left hand side, rotate the cheater a little bit clockwise, then recut the entire crown facets. See if that line has straightened itself out. If it has, congratulations, you've finished your alignment. If it hasn't, then keep tweaking that cheater until you get your girdle line to be perfectly level. When you're cutting your crown facets, if you're starting off by using your 260, make sure to go very slow and cautiously. The 260 has a tendency to knock giant chips out of the girdle, and if one of those chips happens to hit the pavilion, then there's nothing you can really do about that. Now you've got this nasty chip, and a jeweler might get pissed off at you if you're trying to set the stone. So, just keep in mind, if you're using your 260 for your first set of crown facets, go very slow, and leave yourself a lot of extra girdle width. That way, if you get one of those chips, you might still have room to work it out with your 600. One of the big concerns on cutting the crown is running out of girdle room. You can imagine that as you cut the crown, you're lowering the girdle height, you're lowering it, lowering it, lowering it. If you overcut, now you start cutting into your pavilion. That's something that we really want to try to avoid. So, I'm only going to use my 260 to go so far. And I'm only going to use my 600 to go so far. I want to make sure that I leave enough girdle width so that once I get to my pre-polishing stage, the girdle is about where it should be. And don't forget, pre-polishing takes off more material. So you want to leave yourself a little bit of an extra buffer, more than you think you need, when you're pre-polishing. Take a look at the girdle width. Is this too thick or too thin? Honestly, it's probably too thick. Regardless of the size of your stone, the girdle is there so that a jeweler can set your stone. So that means that you want your girdle width to be somewhere between 0.1 and 0.3 millimeters, occasionally up to 0.5 for larger things like pendants. So, for a small stone, a girdle of 0.1 millimeters might be a pretty sizable girdle. Whereas for a massive stone, a girdle of 0.1 millimeters is probably going to look paper thin. Other than a few tips and tricks, cutting the crown is mechanistically pretty much the same as cutting the pavilion. So, I'm just going to go ahead and skip through all of that. If you're having trouble seeing your meat points, or if you can't get the lighting quite right to be able to see what you're doing, you can try this little trick. Take an aluminum dot and kind of just brush it over your 600 cut stone. This will highlight all of the facet junctions and make it a lot easier to see where you're going. Here's an example of what your stone will look like after you're done tracing it with your aluminum dop. As you can see, the facet junctions are very clearly outlined, but because of the thickness of that aluminum line, it's not really useful for telling whether or not your meat points are accurate.
Now that we finished the crowd, how are we going to cut the table? I tried setting the angle setting as low as it would go, but once you get to around three and a half degrees, the thumb screw starts to hit the rest of the machine. Thankfully, we've got this little table adapter. How do we use it? First, remove the dot and remove the thumb screw that holds the dot in place. That's both of these right here. Next, set your angle to 45 degrees, or if you have a 90 degree table and adapter, which is my preference, set your angle to 90 degrees. Unfortunately, I don't have a 90 degree adapter, so I'm just going to use this 45. I've set my angle to 45. Now I'm just going to slip the adapter over the well. I'm going to gradually lower the mast until the adapter touches the bottom and is forced up the quill. Once you notice an angle change, you've gotten too far. Now, there are two set screws that I'm going to tighten with this Allen wrench to hold the adapter in place. There's a spot for a third screw, but that doesn't hold the adapter to the quill. That holds the dot inside the adapter. Now we're going to cut the table. We're going to cut it the same way as we do everything else. Cut on 600, pre-polish on 3000, and then polish on dark side. Under no circumstances should you ever use a 260 to cut the table. You're going to knock huge chunks out of everything, and that's just going to be bad news. Now, when we're actually cutting the table, how are we going to get a good look at the stone to make sure that we're getting our meats? Well, you could just lift it up and take a good look. But you can rotate the index from 96 to 48. Now the stone's pointing straight up. It's a lot easier to maneuver the light to get a good look when you've rotated the index from 96 to 48. Now we're going to cover our last learning point. So we've established a meet point using C2 and C3. Now we're going to cut our table to meet there. Again, with all meet points, we're going to cut short and then pre-polish in. This is no exception. One of the big things here is that if you screw up on this step, there's no way to go back and fix it. If you try to go back and fix it, you're going to need to realign the girdle. And now that you've cut the girdle very thin, it's very difficult to do that. So, go slow. Another point about meet point tables is that all of your errors throughout the entire stone will accumulate at the table. So, if you've missed one meet point on the pavilion, and that set a girdle facet out of line, and that affected your C1 and your C2, and then it affected your C3 facets, then you're going to notice that on one area of your table, it's going to be a little wonky. Either it's going to be blobby on that side, or it'll be a little bit smaller on that side than it should be. So the way to fix that is to just make sure that you're accurate throughout every step of fastening. It's not a big deal if you're a little bit off. Nobody's really going to notice once it's set in jewelry anyway. But just for personal improvement, it's a good thing to keep in mind. There are two important considerations when you're polishing your table, especially with the dark side. The first is that since the table facet is usually very large, it'll take a long time to polish. The second is that if your lap gets the least bit dry, you'll get some really loud squeaks. This is pretty mild. Usually, if I'm running a little bit dry, it'll be much louder. More along those lines. Alright, our stone is done. We've taken it out, and now we're just ready to release the stone from the dock. Once again, I've wrapped the dock in a paper towel with the paper towel covering the stone, and I'm going to blowtorch the hell out of the dop. Now, since the stone is done, I really, really don't want to run the risk of cracking the stone. And if you heat for too long, and you get a temperature gradient across the stone, that can lead to cracking. So, basically just going to keep hitting this and blowtorching it. The quote-unquote real way to do this 
is to just put the entire assembly into a shot glass full of acetone. The acetone will dissolve away the glue, and then the stone pops right out. But I'm very impatient, and since this is relatively inexpensive, I'm willing to risk blowing up the stone. Now that the stone's popped out of the top, there's probably going to be glue left on the back. So, I'm just going to scratch that off with my fingernail. Usually it should come off pretty easily, but if it doesn't, you can just soak the stone in acetone, and it'll dissolve off the rest of the glue. There are certainly more advanced methods on how to facet some of which can go a lot faster, some of which can give you higher yield on your rough. But, these methods are very easy for beginners to learn, and they're important for laying the groundwork on how to do those more advanced methods in the future. We've also chosen a relatively inexpensive piece of rough, smoky quartz, because trying out fasting for the first time would be pretty stressful on something worth a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand dollars. Now, some professional fasteners are going to be putting out educational materials in the future. These are going to be very highly modern, with color pictures and video. But until then, I'll be putting out some simple, easy-to-follow beginner videos. So until then, thanks for watching.